If you have vivid memories of growing up in your hometown during the late 1950s and early 1960s, please share your experiences. Life seemed much simpler back then, right? Many people fondly reminisce about their childhood, often describing it with humor and nostalgia. Despite joking about it, their words convey genuine warmth. One such memory is the quirky fashion trends, like bell-bottom pants, that our parents considered the epitome of coolness. Join us as we explore 20 funny and nostalgic things that might make you feel old if you remember them. We've prepared a delightful evening's entertainment for you, promising hours of relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Did you know that people once used sharing tubes to listen to jukebox music? Jukeboxes have a fascinating history that traces back to Thomas Edison, the inventor of cameras and light bulbs. These machines, often found in pubs and bars, allow you to choose a song by pressing buttons with letters and numbers. During the 1940s and 1950s, jukeboxes were incredibly popular, with three quarters of all records in America being played on them. World War II briefly interrupted jukebox production, but it resumed afterward, becoming the heart of pubs and bars, providing people with a variety of music. Let's take a trip down memory lane to a time when doorstep deliveries were the norm. The iconic milkman with his daily rounds delivering fresh milk. Home milk delivery dates back to the late 1700s when families had their cows. As urbanization increased, people turned to local dairy farmers for milk. The first home milk deliveries occurred in Vermont in 1785, with milkmen bringing metal barrels to customers' doors. However, the decline of home milk delivery began in the 1930s and 1940s with widespread refrigeration and the rise of grocery stores. Refrigerators reduced the need for frequent milk deliveries, and grocery stores offered a one-stop shop. Suburbanization after World War I increased, making milk delivery more costly, and cars made it easier to access grocery stores independently. By the 1950s, plastic containers replaced glass bottles, contributing to the decline of home milk delivery. Today, the resurgence of home milk delivery taps into a bygone era, rekindling memories of friendly milkmen and clinking glass bottles. History has a way of repeating itself, even in the world of fashion. Flare pants, also known as bell-bottoms, are making a strong comeback. These pants have a fascinating origin story, dating back to the early 19th century when sailors in the U.S. Navy sported flared pants due to the lack of a set uniform. The British Royal Navy later adopted this style for its practicality for sailors working on boats. Fast forward to the 1960s and 70s, when the hippie movement embraced bell-bottoms, often found as surplus navy gear in thrift stores. The disco era brought its own twists, with variations like long pants and elephant bells. Nowadays, flare pants have taken on various forms, from leggings to trousers, effortlessly pairing with platform sneakers and making a stylish comeback. Have you ever wondered about the origins of the classic drive-in movie experience? Before the era of multiplex theaters, drive-ins were a popular choice for families and couples alike. The first patented drive-in opened in 1933 in New Jersey, aiming to provide a more comfortable movie-watching experience for those who found cramped theater seats challenging. Over the following decades, drive-ins gained immense popularity, especially in the 1950s and 60s offering families a space to bond and couples an affordable date night option. Despite facing challenges such as seasonal screenings, weather dependence, and economic shifts like the 70s oil crisis and the rise of home entertainment, some drive-ins persevered and adapted to the changing times. Today, a few drive-ins still thrive, showcasing a mix of current and classic films and even offering double feature nights. Cabbage Patch Kids were super popular dolls in the 1980s. These cloth dolls with plastic heads were made by CCO Industries in 1982, inspired by Xavier Roberts's Little People Dolls. 
Roger L. Schlafer renamed them Cabbage Patch Kids when he got the rights in 1982. The Cabbage Patch Kids. Each doll is different, and you can pretend to adopt them. My baby has a real diaper. These dolls broke sales records for three years, becoming a top choice for kids in the 1980s and one of the longest-lasting doll brands in the U.S. Besides dolls, they sold kids' clothes, bedding, baby wear, music albums, and board games. You did not get a Cabbage Patch doll this morning. No, I did not. How badly do you want one? Very, very badly. In the 80s, Cabbage Patch Kids made about $2 billion in sales, starting with artist Martha Nelson Thomas in the early 70s. However, a guy named Xavier Roberts took her idea and put his name on the doll, making it a huge hit in 1983. The dolls were so popular that there were shortages, causing chaos in toy stores. Today, Cabbage Patch Kids serve as nostalgic reminders of the 1980s. Ever heard of a sock hop? If you're interested in throwing a sock hop party or attending one, here's a quick guide. A sock hop, also known as a record hop, was a casual dance event for teenagers in North America during the mid 20th century. These events featuring popular music were often sponsored and started in 1944 as a way for the American Junior Red Cross to raise funds. By 1948, sock hops became a trend among American teenagers, commonly held in high schools, gymnasiums, or cafeterias. The name sock hop originated because participants had to take off their hard-soled shoes to protect the gymnasium floor. Music at these events was typically played from vinyl records, sometimes by a disc jockey or live bands. In later years, sock hops became closely associated with the 1950s and early rock and roll, eventually being used more broadly for any informal dance for teenagers. Just take Swanson TV turkey dinners from the freezing compartment of our refrigerator when I'm a little off schedule. What's in your fridge? Whether it's condiments, takeout containers, or something fuzzy and unrecognizable, many of us have fridges like that. Sometimes making a homemade meal is tough, and that's where frozen entrees come in handy. Frozen convenience foods have a long history, with Swanson Brothers often credited for their invention thanks to a mix-up with Thanksgiving leftovers. The concept gained popularity in 1954, making TV dinners a hit and selling over 25 million in the first year alone. Over time, frozen meals have evolved, offering diverse options like gourmet dishes, organic choices, and meals for specific dietary needs. Today, the freezer aisle boasts a variety of delicious and specialized options for all tastes and preferences. Remember the excitement of roller rinks and all-night skating? Here's a reminder from Skate World Center. Screaming Wheels Roller Rink, All Night Ramble 375. Here's a reminder about Wednesday from 9 until 3 a.m., ladies free for the first hour. Roller skating, initially a basic wooden contraption in the 18th century, has evolved into a widespread global phenomenon. In the 18th century, roller skates started as a basic means of transportation with wooden wheels, challenging to maneuver compared to today's advanced designs. The 20th century saw roller skating gain popularity as a recreational activity with the introduction of ball bearing wheels, revolutionizing the experience. The 1970s and 1980s brought roller disco and roller derby, each with its unique charm. In recent years, roller skating has experienced a resurgence with innovative designs, diverse skate options, and a growing community. As we enter the 21st century, Roller skating has become a thriving culture, connecting enthusiasts worldwide through social media. Remember those cozy coverings for legs that look like long, thick socks without the feet? Let's dive into the next nostalgic memory. Leg warmers, not just a fashion statement, serve the practical purpose of keeping your lower legs toasty in chilly weather. Whether you're cycling, playing soccer, hiking, ice skating, or dancing, Leg warmers are your go-to companions. Originally made from sheep wool, modern ones can be cotton, synthetic fibers, or even Chanel. Ballet dancers use them to keep their leg muscles warm and prevent cramps. 
but there's no solid proof yet if they really prevent injuries. Back in the 1980s, leg warmers became a trendy fashion, especially for teenagers influenced by movies like Fame and Flashdance. Nowadays, they've made a comeback, not just for fashionistas, but also for practical parents, keeping their little ones warm and making diaper changes a breeze. Get ready to shake things up with the sh sh hula hoop, the hoop with the sound. The hula hoop, a toy hoop that you spin around your waist, arms, or neck, gained popularity in the 1950s with lively marketing in parks, playgrounds, and college campuses. The modern hula hoops idea originated from bamboo hoops in Australia, inspiring the plastic hula hoop we know today. Introduced by the Whammo Toy Company in 1958, it quickly became a trend, with millions sold in a short period. Hula hoops are easy to use but work better for people with thin waists, especially women. Are mullets cool again? They just might be. Even though mullets might not be the first thing you think of when it comes to stylish hair, they have a surprisingly ancient history. Mullets were a popular choice for warriors in ancient times, like Native Americans, Romans, Vikings, and ancient Celts. It wasn't a fashion statement back then, it was a practical choice for war. Long hair at the back kept soldiers warm, while a short front prevented hair from getting in their faces during battles. In the 19th and 20th centuries, mullets got a bad reputation and were seen as a sign of low social class. But the rebellious spirit associated with mullets has endured. In the early 60s and 70s, they became a symbol of defiance. So, are mullets making a comeback? History says they've always had a knack for being unexpectedly cool. Enter the world of poodle skirts, a wide swingy skirt made of felt with a single color design attached, often featuring a styled poodle or other designs like flamingos, flowers, or hot rod cars. These knee-length skirts became a hit among teenage girls for school dances and everyday wear in 1947, when Julie Lynn Charlotte designed the first poodle skirt in the United States. Originally, she needed a quick Christmas skirt, but struggled with little money and sewing skills, creating a seamless felt skirt. The popularity grew, leading to Charlotte's creation of a dog-themed version. Poodle skirts gained fame with movie stars and in magazines, becoming the first teenage fashion trend. Today, poodle skirts serve as nostalgic symbols of the 1950s, often worn as retro items with modern reproductions made from contemporary felt. Have you ever wondered about the simple circle with three lines inside that has become a global symbol of peace? In 1958, British graphic designer Gerald Holtham created what we now know as the peace sign. Initially designed for anti-nuclear activists, it evolved into a representation of world peace, transcending its origins. Holtom drew inspiration from naval semaphore flags, combining codes for N and D to signify nuclear disarmament. However, the design also held a personal, darker meaning for him, a symbol of deep despair. Adopted by the British Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, the peace is signed quickly spread to the United States and beyond. From its debut on banners in London to its appearance on Vietnam protest posters and t-shirts in the 1960s, the peace sign has left an indelible mark on popular culture. Do you remember the pet rock craze in the United States in 1975? Gary Dahl, an advertising man from California, came up with the idea during a dinner with friends. His concept was to have a pet that needed no care or feeding. Dahl wrote a pet rock training manual and decided to sell actual pet rocks. He bought inexpensive stones, packaged them in gift boxes with the manual, and sold them for $2 each. The rocks became a hit and Dahl received numerous orders. By Christmas, he had sold over a million rocks, making him a millionaire. However, the craze quickly faded and imitators flooded the market. Dahl, having made enough money, gave away unsold rocks to charity. He later focused on a new career, giving motivational speeches and writing books on making money quickly. 
The pet rock returned in 2012 but hasn't sold as much as it did in the 70s. Back then, a basic rock became one of the best-selling funny gifts ever. Have you ever been captivated by those unconventional lamps that seem to defy gravity? The iconic lava lamp? In 1963, British entrepreneur Edward Craven Walker birthed the iconic lava lamp, a groovy creation with a captivating flow of colored wax in a liquid-filled glass vessel. As the lamp's bulb heats the wax mixture, it rises, cools, and gracefully descends in a hypnotic dance reminiscent of lava flows, hence the name. Initially associated with hippie and cannabis cultures, these lamps have evolved over the years. The magic lies in a unique formula involving mineral oil, paraffin wax, and carbon tetrachloride, now replaced due to toxicity concerns. This concoction's density dance, driven by heat, creates the mesmerizing lava lamp effect. Did you know that breakdancing, also called breaking, started in the South Bronx of New York City in the 1970s? Back then, people in this neighborhood were inspired by the music and dances of the time, like funk, soul, and disco. Breakdancing is closely linked to hip-hop culture and is one of the original four elements of hip-hop, alongside rapping, DJing, and graffiti art. It involves fancy footwork, acrobatic moves, and a lot of creativity. Quickly, it became famous in the United States and around the world. Over the years, breakdancing has changed and adapted with different styles from various places, making it diverse and interesting. The big news is that in 2024, it was declared that breakdancing would be part of the Olympic Games in Paris. The 70s were pretty cool, weren't they? Have you ever thought about how those cumbersome eight-track tapes became a sensation in the 1960s? William Powell Lear, during the early 1960s, brought about a music revolution with the creation of the Lear Jet cartridge, leading to the widespread adoption of eight-track tapes. Originally created for cars as an alternative to AM and later FM radio, the 1970s saw the peak of eight-track tape popularity prominently displayed alongside vinyl records in record stores. However, smaller cassette tapes gained momentum for their compact size in cars and homes. By 1982, major labels stopped selling 8-track tapes to stores, but they continued through record clubs until 1988. Fleetwood Mac's 1988 release was the last from a major label. Despite major labels abandoning them, smaller companies still produce 8-track tapes today. Have you ever taken a trip down memory lane to the golden age of arcade video games? It was a cool time in the late 1970s to the early 1980s when arcade games were booming. Space Invaders in 1978 kicked off a frenzy of shoot 'em up games like Galaxian and the space-themed Asteroids in 1979. Thanks to new technology, arcade games went from black and white to colorful adventures like Frogger and Centipede. Arcades became a big deal in pop culture offering new and exciting games. Did you ever play Defender, Galaga, or Chase Mazes in Pac-Man? Driving and racing got a 3D twist, with games like Turbo and Pole Position. Characters like Pac-Man and Mario became stars, appearing in songs, cartoons, and movies like Tron in 1982. However, in 1983, things took a nosedive due to too many copies of popular games, home video consoles, and concerns about kids' influences, leading to a decline. The 1990s saw a comeback, though. Sure, Sir Isaac Newton unraveled the mysteries of gravity, but could he have unraveled the mysteries of Rubik's Cube? The Rubik's Cube, a small square measuring 2 and 1 one four inches on each side, with rows of squares that can be moved and come in different colors, has puzzled people for over 35 years. The Rubik's Cube was invented by a person named Rubik in Hungary in 1974 and hit the Western market in 1980, quickly becoming a sensation with over 350 million cubes sold worldwide. Mixtapes, those nostalgic compilations of music on cassette tapes, hold a special place in the hearts of those who remember the era of cassettes in the 1980s. People exchanged mixtapes to convey messages or set a mood. 
These tapes, made by compiling songs from various sources, were a blend of creativity and personal expression, initially a popular trend among DJs. Mixtapes became a way for artists to showcase their skills and for DJs to create demos for potential clients. They were also a backup plan for parties in case of equipment failure. However, the practice of creating mixtapes led to piracy issues in the 70s and 80s, prompting changes in the music industry. Now you've traveled through time, exploring various nostalgic memories from different eras. Each piece of history has its unique charm and significance, contributing to the rich tapestry of human experiences. As we look back, we not only appreciate the past, but also see how it has shaped our present and influenced the trends and innovations of today.